So, welcome, Anel, to Singapore. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, can you make a brief introduction of yourself first? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you for welcoming here in Singapore. Uh, I am Arnel Casanova. Uh, I'm a senior advisor to the Vice President of the Philippines, who is concurrently also the Chair of the Housing and Urban Development Council of the Philippines. I used to be the uh, CEO of the Basis Conversion Development Authority, which is tasked with the development of the former military bases in the Philippines. So, okay, thank you. So, Anil, you told me this morning that uh, today is the third anniversary of Typhoon Haiyan having hit the Philippines. And I understand there are a lot of rebuilding efforts uh, in the Philippines. Can I ask you to share your thoughts on this and about urban resilience um, and opportunities uh, in general? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, uh, we are now celebrating to this day the third year of uh, the devastation that uh, Typhoon Haiyan had created in the Philippines. Um, well, considerably in the uh, disaster relief operations, we were very fast. In fact, the Philippines was able to uh, provide relief uh, among the communities that had been affected. The challenge now actually is in the rebuilding. And it's not only rebuilding for the sake of building, but rebuilding better uh, in a safer, much more resilient and uh, accessible areas. So uh, we needed to, out of the 1.1 million houses that had been destroyed by Typhoon Haiyan, we needed to relocate 205,128 families out of harm's way because currently they're living in danger areas. If another super typhoon comes in in that region, then those 205,000 families were definitely in direct uh, danger of being affected and probably dying uh, because of the disaster again. So um, third year to the day, um, uh, out of the 205,000 families, um, we were only be able to build about 25,000 houses. Uh, and therefore, there's a need to really catch up with the schedule and hopefully in two or three years time, we're able to relocate them in safer grounds. So those are the challenge, but at the same time, the opportunities are great in creating a model where you could build new communities uh, vibrantly, economically, um, culturally, and as a community to really sh uh, change the paradigm in rebuilding and resettlement areas. Uh, we must be able to create new communities with enough source of power, water, uh, even uh, uh, be able to identify themselves as a community. And then, in times of disaster, be able to, to be more resilient. In fact, in our specifications in rebuilding houses, we have uh, increased the requirement that the wind load of each house should be at the minimum 250 kilometers per hour uh, wind, uh, wind load. You have touched on the topic of sustainable urban development mm -hmm. and affordable housing. Can you elaborate a bit more on these topics? Uh, well, in the Philippines, we have uh, we projected that there will be a backlog of about 5.6 million houses. Uh, our population is growing, our economy is growing. Uh, Metro Manila is one of the densest cities in the world and terribly congested. So those are the challenges. Um, so we needed to really uh, think of new ideas. And the reason why I'm here is also we could probably learn from the best practice of Singapore, particularly in the field of uh, public rental housing. Um, because we see the old model of the government in addressing homelessness and lack of shelter is to provide subsidized housing to the homeless people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a uh, disadvantage to that also. Um, it creates speculation and uh, also uh, further um, provide uh, a mechanism or a, a, an incentive for the homeless person to eventually sell that subsidized housing to someone who can afford and then again squat somewhere else. It does not really immediately address the the need for a long-term and more dignified housing. It created simply a speculation and selling again. And government loses asset by 
subsidizing and giving away subsidized properties. Meantime, the urban poor would have to sell it again to someone who can afford, probably a rich developer. Uh, so there's a gap from homelessness to home ownership. And that gap is very big. Uh, and that gap could be addressed by public rental housing program, which we believe uh, uh, we could learn a lot from, uh, from uh, Singapore also. Mm. And Anil, um, you told me earlier on also that uh, the Philippines is looking at some longer term solution uh, than um, just discussing urban agendas. Can you tell me more about that? Oh, yes. Well, thank you uh, for asking yeah. the question. I think it's very important for any country, and particularly the Philippines, to have a national urban development plan because urbanization is a reality that we're facing in the, in the succeeding decades. Uh, um, eventually, about 75% of Filipinos would be living in the cities. And by number, you are immediately thinking of 75 uh, million. Uh, of course, Singapore is 5 million, but Again, that's also a challenge in, in, in your, in your, in your uh, planning. But currently, there's no national urban master plan. There's an agenda, but that agenda must be translated into real-life detailed master plan that would capture the vision in the creating a plan for the next 50 years. Uh, building cities takes time, uh, and it creates a change in behavior as well of communities and people. So we must be able to create a, uh, a country and build up by building our cities much more sustainably, uh, much more disaster resilient, and much more inclusive uh, so that you could create opportunities for everyone. In fact, I believe as a city builder myself, I've been in, in, this, in this field for almost 20 years, I believe that how you design and build a physical space could also provide the opportunities for bridging the gap of inequality. Uh, we see in the past, cities were built with ghettos, with slums, and the rich and the poor are, you know, there's a divide, a great divide, not only emotionally and economically, but physically, even the roads, the sharing of common spaces. So the more vibrant cities are actually those with more vibrant common spaces, mm -hmm. uh, accessible and mo much more mobile people. So when the dignity of a human being is much more translated in the kind of design that you do in a physical space, uh, then that country it's much, becomes much more stronger and more sustainable. That sounds like a good segue for me to ask you, um, how do you think um, the Philippines can, uh, as, as many cities are doing, institutionalize a system of urban governance and good urban leadership? Oh, I think, you know, uh, having been in this field for more than uh, two decades, mm. almost two decades, uh, I realized that at the end of the day, you, must, you may have the best plans, the most beautiful plans in the world, but if you cannot execute, then that's nothing. And the execution, the key to execution is good governance and leadership. Um, so in the Philippines, uh, let's uh, use Metro Manila as an example. There are 17 cities in the Metro Manila areas. The, they are like separate, 17 separate kingdoms. They have their own governance. In fact, in one city, you have a number coding system, mm -hmm. and in the next city, there's no number coding system. So if you're a, if you're a motorist, then you are traversing two, uh, two cities with different rules in traffic. So it creates congestion and a lack of cohesion in, in dealing with uh, floods, with traffic, with power, and with the necessary utilities. So, uh, and even in the sharing of the roads. So in the, in the Philippines, we really need to have create a national urban development plan, which would serve as a guide for every local government units as well to synchronize their plans with the national development strategy. At the end of the day, uh, each cities, each municipalities, and each provinces, they have to look at the national vision so that we could create a team, you know, create a unity in how we move the country forward, one city, one town, and one barangay to, to, towards that same direction. So I think the, and that's the reason why I'm doing volunteer work as a senior advisor to the vice president, because she is tasked and she has the mandate 
to really craft this plan, uh, create a 50-year vision for the Philippines when it comes to urbanization. Well, I, you have been sharing with me earlier also on working with disadvantaged communities and especially communities that are caught in the spiral of po uh, poverty. Mm -hmm. So what ideas do you have to improve such communities? Oh, well, uh, if I may use my own example myself. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, well, I used to tell you I was a slum dweller. I'm actually a great example of how migration occurs and how poor people could, uh, could, could actually move up the economic ladder. Uh, well, I used to live in a farm and we were, my family was a landless family, uh, but I needed to go have an education. In my village, and in my family, in fact, I was the first college graduate. Uh, my two older brothers were not able to go to college because of poverty. Uh, because in the rural areas, uh, there are a lack of opportunities. The quality of education is not as good as you'll find in the cities. So for college, I had to live in the slums. I had to migrate to the city. And the only affordable shelter for a migrant going into the city is really the slums. Um, and I was renting a shanty there right on the creek. But fortunately, I got a scholarship in the University of the Philippines, which is a state on our university. So eventually, uh, when I graduated, created more opportunities. Then, of course, uh, the, the, uh, eventually, and I moved up my career and now my family I could be proud to say is not poor anymore. We have lifted the entire family out of poverty. Um, the key there is really in a city you need to create the institutions that provide for the development of the human capital. Uh, education is number one. If you provide quality educational institutions and when I mean educational institution it does not necessarily refer to the formal Mm. educational institutions. This could be training institutes. This could be uh, um, research facilities um, which could capture the uh, wealth of knowledge that even poor people have. Mm. So if you provide a kind, if you break that barrier that education is only for the rich uh, and you provide as a public institution, particularly for governments, to increase the quality of education and also healthcare, provide opportunity because even if you don't, if you, even if you have very bright young children, if they're not being fed and taken care of properly, then the future of the country is bleak. You have to have healthy citizens. So governments, I think, government's job is really is to create those institutions that would develop the human capital at the end of the day. And the, the healthier, the smarter, innovative, and much more hopeful people the better country you will have in the long term. Okay, thank you so much, Anel, for sharing your ideas with the Center for Livable Cities. Mm -hmm. And we wish you the best in your endeavors in improving uh, the urban conditions that you have been talking about. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really uh, happy to be here at the CLC. Thank you. Thank you.